not naturally holy and blameless. Because if, if mankind was naturally holy and blameless, God would not have had to choose a people to make holy and blameless. Now this should cause us to think deeply. Does it matter that left to ourselves, we are unholy and we have blame and guilt before a holy God. Well, dear friends, to understand why Paul is praising God for, for choosing us, to, to understand Paul's heart here, why, why he's praising God for this, we, we must understand why being unholy and having guilt matters. And dear friends, to do this, we must understand something of God's holiness and its implications for our lives. So let us consider briefly the holiness of God. There is a great biblical emphasis on God's holiness. If you read the Bible, one thing you're going to notice very quickly is that whatever it means, God is a holy God. Exodus, we have this Song of Moses, and Moses cries out, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Leviticus 19, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. 1 Samuel 2 2, there is none holy like the Lord. Psalm 99, verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. The great theophany of God manifesting himself to Moses through the burning bush. This burning bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. So, so Moses is curious, and he begins to, to draw near to the bush, but, but God's presence is there in a sense. So God stops him and says, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. In, in a sense, he's protecting Moses. Don't come any closer to the holy God. John Frame notes the ground is holy, not because there is something special or dangerous about the ground as such, but because Yahweh is there, the supreme holy one. And we see this account of Mount Sinai. There before the mount stand the children of Israel, and God warns them. He says, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go into the mountain or touch the edge. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. God's presence was going to be on this mountain, and he says, don't come near it. Don't even touch the edge, or you will be put to death. And then in Exodus 26, we learn about the tabernacle. And there's a place in the tabernacle called the holy place. And Israel is to hang up a veil to separate that from what is called the most holy place or the, the holy of holies. And this place that is called the holy of holies is not to be entered into. Only the priest can enter and that only once a year or else what? Death would occur. It is forbidden that the most holy place is forbidden, and to enter it means certain death. But what does Scripture mean by God is holy? Scripture tells us two things about God's holiness. In essence, there are two dimensions of God's holiness. First, there is God's magnificence. 
He is above us and superior to us in every way possible, to an infinite degree. He is, he is not like us. Burkhoff referred to this as God's majestic holiness, saying that God is absolutely distinct from all his creatures and is exalted above them in infinite majesty. And Sproul notes that that which is holy is that which is other, that which is different from something else. So when the Bible speaks about God's holiness, the primary thrust of those statements is to refer to God's transcendence, to his magnificence, to that sense in which God is higher and superior to anything there is in the creaturely realm. And Frame notes that God's holiness is his uniqueness. His, trans his transcendence as creator. It is his majesty for the holy God is like a great king who, who we dare not treat like other persons. What was the mistake that people made? God said, you thought that I was like you. I am different. I am other. I am holy. Donald McLeod notes there's a terrifying unfamiliarity in the things that God says about himself. When we consider our own hearts, the own sinfulness of our hearts and of our minds, know and understand that God is nothing like that. We, we, we find sin funny and, and humorous and, and amusing, but God is nothing like that. He is totally different. But there's another dimension of God's holiness. And that is God's moral or ethical purity. Beacon Smalley in the Reformed Systematic Theology notes that the moral holiness of God is the absolute righteousness of his whole nature. This is closely related to God's righteousness or what theologians often refer to as the, the internal righteousness of God, which is his moral excellence. And not that there's some moral code that is above God, but morality is defined by who God is. And he is perfectly consistent with who he is. So when we say that he is holy, we are saying that he is morally pure. Ethically pure. He never compromises. Can you imagine that? Having that type of consistency. You know, I think to myself, uh, morals that I have, ethics that I have. And, and when you really begin to be squeezed in certain situations, you start wondering, is there some kind of way for me to compromise? Such is not the case with God. So much so that, that when Christ took upon himself our sins and became legally guilty for our sins, God did not just say, forget it, let's just ignore this ever happened, but he crushed his only son. That is God's holiness. But we also must note that these two separate dimensions of God's holiness cannot be separated. They are different dimensions, not different attributes. And so one systematic theology notes in the moral realm, too, God's holiness also denotes his separation and supremacy. And as Frame notes, the Lord's holiness transcends us not only as creatures, but especially as sinners. So this separation between God and us is not, is not just about his majesty, but about his moral purity as well. So when we say that God is holy, that this means that God is infinitely above us, infinitely different than us in his majesty and his moral purity. But what are the implications of this? Well, first of all, because God is holy, he requires us to be holy. 
Again, Leviticus 19, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Because God is holy, he requires holiness or or moral purity from mankind. This means separation from sin. It means righteousness. And so he has given us his law, his perfect, holy, righteous law as his standard for living. And this is why we have the Ten Commandments. God tells us to have no other God before him. To to not make any graven images. To to not take his name in vain or or defile his Sabbath day or to to dishonor our parents or to, to kill, to commit adultery, to steal, to bear false witness or to covet. Why does God tell us not to do these things? Because he requires holiness from us. This is God's standard for holiness. This means that this is God's standard for for how he judges whether or not we are holy or righteous in his sight. But also because God is holy, he is a jealous God. Frame notes that God deserves and demands exclusive worship and allegiance. In Exodus 20, as God is given the second commandment, this is what he says. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. He's given the commandment not to be idolatrous. Why? Because he is jealous. And you say, I thought jealousy was a bad thing. Jealousy here has to do with his zeal for purity. As Frame notes, a husband is right to be jealous for the affection and love and faithfulness of his wife. If a man's wife was unfaithful and and that man did not become jealous, could, could we really say that he loved her? So God, as our creator, says, worship me and worship me alone. And and you better do this. Why? Because I am a jealous God. And this is frightening. Because God's jealousy is connected to God's wrath and his judgment. In Deuteronomy, he says, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. In Deuteronomy 6, we read, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from the face of the earth. Don't commit idolatry. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I don't share my glory with another. But also, because God is holy, he actually hates wickedness. And and guess what? He hates the wicked. We we have this misunderstanding that that God hates the sinner, or he hates the sin rather, but loves the sinner. In, In scripture, there is no separation between the sin and the sinner. God actually says that he abhors the wicked. That that the wicked are an abomination in his sight. And we say, wait a minute, God is love. Yes. But because God is love, he must hate evil. Frame notes that God cannot love goodness without actually hating evil. That God by nature is throughout eternity passionately opposed to evil. And that this hatred pervades all his thoughts and actions. God is the supreme hater. Of wickedness. So God, because of his holiness, demands holiness from his creatures. 
And because of his holiness, when we do not worship him, when we worship ourselves and other things, he is provoked to jealousy. And God hates wickedness. He hates wickedness more than we could possibly imagine. He is the supreme hater of wickedness. So what does a holy God do with wicked people who have angered him and provoked him to jealousy? This is a serious question. Because the Bible tells us that one day we have to stand before this God in judgment. The writer of Hebrews tells us that it is appointed for, for all men to die once, but after this, the judgment. But perhaps God would just let people slide. But then in Acts we're told, he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. One day we will stand before God in judgment. And because he is a holy God, he will judge us in complete righteousness, which means he will judge us based upon our obedience to his commands. And since he is a holy judge, he requires absolute perfection. And our sins have angered him and provoked him to jealousy. And he hates the wicked. What then does he do with us? In Colossians, Paul writes concerning sin that on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Those who stand before God in judgment without being absolutely morally perfect will receive his wrath. This is what scripture teaches us. Hebrew says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Dear friends, if you stand before the Lord being unholy and having guilt because of disobedience to his law, you will receive the wrath of God, which means being cast into hell. And our Lord tells us, fear him. Whom after he has killed the body has power to cast into hell. Fear him. That, that dreadful place where there, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That, that dreadful place described as a lake of fire. That, that dreadful place where we are told the, the fire is never quenched. Consider that. R.C. Sproul says, perhaps the most frightening aspect of hell is its eternality. Because people can endure the greatest agony if they know it will ultimately stop. But in hell, there is no such hope. The Bible clearly teaches that, that the punishment is eternal. The same word is used for both eternal life and eternal death. And punishment implies pain. Jonathan Edwards, in preaching on Revelation 6, said that wicked men will hereafter earnestly wish to be turned to nothing and forever cease to be, that they may escape the wrath of God. Hell, then, is an eternity before the righteous, ever-burning wrath of God, a suffering torment from which there is no escape or relief. Dear friends, this is what God does because of his holiness to unholy people. And God's holiness ensures that he will not compromise his standards. He will not compromise. And this sounds harsh. How can this be that God would do this to someone? Dear friends, if we ask that question, it is because we do not understand God's holiness. And so we have great examples in Scripture of what happens to men when they begin to understand something of the holiness of God. 
And so we see this in, in Isaiah chapter 6. As a matter of fact, please turn to Isaiah chapter 6 with me so we can look at this together. So we ask the question, what happens when an unholy man begins to understand something of the holiness of God? Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And here we already see God's majestic holiness. That the train of a robe indicates majesty. And, and here in this particular situation, the, the train of God's robe is filling the entire temple. He, he is majestic beyond measure. He is totally different, totally other. And we read above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. I once heard Al Mohler talk about the, 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 the strange way we view angels in our culture. That we draw little cherubs in bathrooms, and, and we have this view of angels being these beautiful people with long flowing hair. But, but every time... People encounter angels in the Bible, they're terrified. And the first thing the angel says is, I come in peace. In other words, don't die. It's a terrifying thing. But, but here are these six-winged creatures flying above the throne of God. Majestic creatures. And R.C. Sproul notes that everything that God has created is created in such a way as to be able to live in its environment. So humans have lungs, so we can breathe air. Fish have gills, so that they can breathe underwater. Seraphim have six wings, so that they can cover their eyes in the face of an infinitely holy and righteous God. And notice that these angelic beings, they're sinless. And they still cannot abide to look into the light of God's holiness. So they fly around in order for them to, to be able to maintain themselves. In order to survive, they have to have a pair of wings to just cover their eyes. Such is the majesty of God's holiness. And if you ever wanted to know, what do those in the presence of God think about God? These seraphim tell us. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And as we pointed out before, no attribute of God is emphasized to the third degree like this. We, we never hear that God is righteous, 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 or love, love, love. But we hear that he is holy, holy, holy. The, the, the holiness here is overwhelming to these seraphim. But what happens when a man begins to see these things and, and experience these things, a, a sinful creature? And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was was filled with smoke, and this was possibly reminding Isaiah of, of, of the, the holiness of God in terms of his wrath and of his judgment. And so what does Isaiah say in verse 5? So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me. He's pronouncing a curse upon himself. And he says, I'm, I'm undone, I, I'm dead, I'm finished, I'm destroyed. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord, the, 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 the Lord of glory. What's happening here? 
A sinful man in the presence of an absolutely holy God is overwhelming. So much so that Isaiah pronounces a curse upon himself and thinks that he's going to die because of the moral superiority of this holy God. This is what happens to Peter when Christ tells him to throw the net on the other side and he catches a bunch of fish and, and he knows he's in the presence of a divine person. And so what does Peter do? He drops down on his knees and he says, depart from me, O Lord. Why? Because I am a sinful man. Your, your holiness is convicting me. It's showing me the sinfulness of my sins. Difference, Isaiah was fine. Before he experienced the holiness of God, but, but in the, the presence of a holy God, he thinks he's going to die and call himself cursed. Because such is the conviction of his sin in light of the holiness of God. And so here we are as Isaiah. Doomed. Because of the holiness of God. So what then do we do? Do we run to the law and begin to do good works and say, God, you require moral perfection. And, and your law is the standard of morality. So I'll run to your law and I'll be a better person. And I'll do what's right in your eyes from now on. But Paul says, no. For no flesh shall be justified in the sight of God by deeds of the law. And, and, and God says, your works are like filthy rags before me. What a predicament to be in. Because God is holy, he demands that we are holy and he will judge us accordingly. And the law is his standard for moral perfection. And those who fall short will experience his wrath. But then we are told we can't obey the law good enough. That there is no salvation through the law for us. So what then do we do? How do we obtain moral perfection? How do we get rid of the guilt that we incur? Paul tells us, but now there is the righteousness of God revealed apart from works of the law. In other words, there is a way to obtain moral perfection apart from works of the law. There, there's a righteousness we can obtain by faith in Jesus Christ, Paul tells us. But, but how can this be? How, how can simple faith make us holy and blameless before him? Paul tells us in Colossians, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. In other words, someone died to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight of God. You say, how does this work? Paul tells us in, in 1 Peter, he says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Jesus, the spotless lamb of God, was perfectly holy, had complete moral excellence, never transgressed God's law. He had absolute innocence before God, no guilt at all, and he was sacrificed in our place. And so we, we see that this great verse that I've mentioned several times, that this great verse of imputation, for he made him who, who knew no sin to be sin for us, 
that we might become the, the righteousness of God in him. And this tells us what Christ did for us and how. First Paul says he knew no sin. Christ was both fully God and, and fully man. So he was able to live a sinless life. Never sinning against the Father. So therefore, he was perfectly holy, perfectly righteous. He had no guilt of his own. And this sinless man took upon himself, himself our sin. And this does not mean that he became a sinner in reality. This is what is called a legal or forensic guilt. So in other words, God looked upon Christ as though he had committed our sins, our unholiness. He, he looked upon Christ as though he had our guilt, our blemishes. And he nailed those things to the cross. Looking upon Christ in his holiness. And Christ, taking upon himself our sins, caused God the Father to pour out his wrath upon his Son. And then Paul says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Dear friends, this is the only way to obtain moral perfection. Is that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. But, but this is what Christ came to do. Not only did he come to take our sins upon himself, but he came to give us his righteousness. He lived every day of his life in perfect obedience to his father. Never committing idolatry. Never prov provoking the father to jealousy. Never ever transgressing the law of God. And he died in our place. And when we put our faith in Christ, he gives us his own moral perfection. Dear friends, when we believe in Jesus for salvation, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us and we become holy and blameless before the Father. And this has been done. This is not a theoretical concept. Notice who Paul is writing this letter to in the first verse. He says to the saints who are in Ephesus. What does the word saint mean? It means holy one. And in fact, the word that Paul uses in verse 1 for saint is the exact same Greek word that he uses here in verse 4 for holy. So how can Paul refer to these people as holy ones? Because of Christ's righteousness. They stand before the Father, morally perfect, holy, and blameless. Dear friends, is this not enough to cause us to praise God like the Apostle Paul? Chapel points out that this is cause for amazement. God sees me as being as holy as his own son. Not only do I have my debt wiped away, I have the riches of Christ's righteousness applied to my account. This is enough to drive us to our knees in praise to God that we get to stand before God and not be judged upon our sins and our unholiness and our guilt, but based upon the perfect holiness and blamelessness of Christ. But Paul takes this one step further. Dear friends, those of us here who know Christ, why have we received the gift of this salvation while others reject it? What is the, the cause of this? You see, we are, we are all born immoral. We are born hating holiness and loving sin. And God would have been perfectly just to damn us in our sins. And he would have been glorified through pouring out his wrath upon us. And not only that, but we are told that because we are born sinful, we cannot choose to follow Christ on our own. 
That the things of the, of, the, of the Spirit of God, the things of Christ, are foolishness to us. We can't make that decision on our own. So why then are we sitting here as, as, as those who are under Christ's righteousness while others reject Him? According to Scripture, we could not be persuaded to follow Christ. It's not just a matter of, of, of being a good enough person to choose him. We, we love our sins and we, we hate holiness. So what on earth would cause us to desire holiness all of a sudden? Why us? Paul says he chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. This is magnificent truth. Before God created the world, He knew that you and I would be unholy sinners. Guilty before him with no way to obtain salvation. And so, because of his love for us, he created a plan to redeem us and make us holy and righteous and blameless in, our, in his sight. Something that we could not do on our own. And he did this. It was his choice. Again, whom he predestines, he calls. Whom he calls, he justifies, he makes them righteous. Who are made righteous in God's eyes? Though, those whom he has called. Who has God called? Those whom he predestined. It's that simple, dear friends. And again, we don't need to look at this as, as, as some kind of doctrine that, that causes us to say, Oh, God is unjust because he lets people go to hell. Dear friends, everyone was on their way to hell and God chose to save us in spite of the journey we were already on, on our, on our own. And, and God had the, 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 the foresight, the forethought to, to say, these people, I am going to judge these people based upon holiness. And they won't have the holiness to stand before me on their own. So I am going to accomplish this for them. Praise the God of sovereign election. Dear friends, the only reason we turn to Christ and can now stand before God on judgment day, holy and blameless, and receive eternal life instead of eternal wrath is because God chose us and he made this decision not based upon your perfect personality not based upon who you are but before the foundation of the world before you could do either good or evil he made this choice may we say with this apostle Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. C can you begin to understand why Paul is saying this in prison? This is a prison epistle. Paul is, is in prison, not knowing whether he is going to live or die. And he's overwhelmed with, with the praiseworthiness of God. Difference, this is what doctrine does for us. Praise God for his election. Because he, he had not elected you, the Holy Spirit would have never regenerated you. And if you were never born again, you would have never been able to repent and believe in Jesus. But because he chose you, his choice is the fount from which all other salvific blessings flow. Praise God for his sovereign choice. Let us pray. Dear God, we 
admit that your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. Father, this doctrine is often a hindrance for people. And even angers people. But when we stand before you, the holy God, understanding the sinfulness of our sin, we praise you, Father, that you chose to pluck us out of the path of destruction. Father, we can think of the Apostle Paul. A man on his way to Damascus to persecute and possibly kill Christians. And you, Father, miraculously saved him instantaneously. And so we see why this great apostle is overwhelmed with your goodness and your sovereign election. Because if, if you did not choose him, he would have went on killing Christians instead of following you. But Father, it's not just the apostle, it's every one of us here. We know that we were born sinners on our way to hell. That your sovereign plan created before the foundation of the world, before, between the Godhead was, was implemented and executed and made effective in our lives so that we would turn from the, the, the wickedness that we loved and, and turn to the holiness that we, that we once hated. Father, if there be any here who, who do not know this sovereign grace, we ask that you would convict them. Father, impress upon their hearts right now a sense of your holiness and of your, your purity and a sense of their sinfulness before a holy God. And may they flee from the wrath to come. And look for refuge in Christ because there is salvation in no other name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.